Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Before introducing the webinar, I'd like to say a few words about BD Canada. BD has been a corporate member of the college, Canadian College of Health Leaders, since 2005. And in 2008, together with the college and BD, introduced the Excellence in Patient Safety Award to the National Awards Program. BD Canada is the exclusive sponsor of this award, which recognizes individuals or teams that are committed to improving patient safety practices in healthcare. Also in 2008, the college recognized BD Canada for their commitment and dedication to Canadian health leadership by presenting them with the college's president award for outstanding corporate membership. In continuing our terrific relationship, we have partnered to offer this webinar today and the, objecti the objectives of which are to review um, the pandemic, COVID-19 epidemiology and health system impact, to share BD Canada capabilities to support COVID-19 response, to discuss the importance of coordinated efforts, local, provincial, and national. Our presenters today from BD include Dr. John Laguno, Medical Director, Jennifer Panunzio, Strategic Marketing Director, and Chelsea Smallwood, Associate Director of Health Economics and Public Policy. So up first is uh, John Laguno, Medical Director. John, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone and welcome and thank you for participating today. I'm John Laguno, BD Canada's medical director, and I'm accountable for patient safety. BD is a global healthcare organization advancing the world of health. And over the next 10 slides, my goal is to bring to life the epidemiology of the COVID-19 virus and its impact to healthcare systems around the world, including Canada. Next slide, please. To begin in level set on December 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization's country office in China was in form of cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology detected in Wuhan City, Hubei province. For us here in Canada and many people around the world, thousands of kilometers away, the outbreak that began in a seafood and poultry market seemed distant and of minimal to moderate concern. However, six months ago to the day, it, came, it became very real. On January 21st, January 25th, 2020, a man in his 50s who arrived in Toronto from Wuhan, China, became the first presumptive case in Canada and was placed into isolation in Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital. Next slide, please. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic March 11th, 2020. Its global impact as of June 24th has resulted in almost 9.4 million cases worldwide and almost half a million deaths. Its impact here in Canada as of June 23rd has resulted in over 100,000 total confirmed Canadian cases, 8,500 deaths, 2.5 million Canadians tested, and 65,000 Canadians have recovered. To put the COVID-19 Canadian mortality rate of 8,454 deaths into perspective, as per Statistics Canada in 2018, Influenza and pneumonia combined killed 8,511 Canadians. When you narrow the scope to just the common flu, the death toll is approximately 500 to 1,500 Canadians. So you can see the impact of COVID year to date. Next slide. By now we're all aware that COVID-19 is mainly transmitted through droplets generated when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or exhales. An infection may occur by breathing in the virus through close contact or by touching a contaminated surface and then your face, eyes, nose, or mouth. On the right-hand side of the slide is the comparative reproductive rate of COVID-19 against other viruses. The reproductive rate is the average number of people that one person with a virus infects. Initially in February, the preliminary reproductive rate for COVID-19 was estimated to be between 2 to 2.5 people. In comparison to the seasonal flu's reproductive rate of 1.5 to 1.9, COVID-19 is highly contagious. Currently, Canada's reproductive rate now hovers around 1, in some jurisdictions in Canada less than 1, but higher in other countries. For example, Germany's reproductive rate in May was 0.75, and, and of Sunday, June 21st, their reproduction rate was reported at 
a concerning increase because this becomes harder to isolate and flatten the curve. Next slide, please. So flattening the curve, you may have seen this graph in numerous publications called flattening the curve. This graph shows a tall, narrow curve and a short, wide curve. Through the graph is a horizontal line that shows how many sick, critical patients in a Canadian hospital, a province, or a country can treat. All curve in blue goes above the line. That means too many people are sick at one time. The implications for a hospital province and to Canada is we won't have enough hospital beds or resources for all the people who will need treatment. The flatter curve in yellow extending to the right shows what happens if the spread of the virus slows down. The same number of people may get sick, but the infection happens over a longer span of time. So hospitals can treat everyone. The aim is to reduce overall infections, and keep cases at a number that healthcare systems can manage, therefore flattening the curve. Next slide. Let's take a look at COVID-19 testing. There are two types of tests, diagnostic tests and antibody tests. Currently, there are two types of diagnostic tests one of which is the most common and approved here in Canada that I presented in front of you today. So across Canada, broad-based diagnostic testing is available through nasopharyngeal PCR testing, which is a diagnostic test that detects the virus genetic material. At present, PCR tests gives us a good indication who is infected, and we can isolate the individual and get in contact with people they've been in touch with so they can quarantine. Next slide. Another diagnostic test is number two, the antigen test. This test requires swabbing and instrumentation, providing results within minutes. These diagnostic tests typically detect fragments of proteins found on or within the virus by testing samples collected from the nasal cavity. According to the CDC, these tests are very specific for the virus, but are not as sensitive as the molecular PCR test. Therefore, a negative result from an antigen test may need to be retested with a PCR test. And finally, on the right, another type of COVID-19 test is the antibody test, also known as serological tests, either at the point of care or in the laboratory. Serological tests detect antibodies. An antibody tells us what proportion of the population has been infected. The key takeaway between the slide that I just covered and this slide is that PCR and antigen tests, number one and two, reflects active infection and our diagnostic test, whereas serological tests, also known as antibody tests, reflect past infection. Next slide. Canada's curve compared to other nations. Given that we just talked about testing and using the dogma, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We've selected nine countries, Brazil, United States, India, United Kingdom, Italy, France, Germany, Japan, including Canada, to examine the growth of COVID-19 cases over time to help explain Canada's current situation and the effectiveness of our response. Not every country has reacted to the coronavirus pandemic in the same way. Some countries' healthcare systems have been hit harder than others. And for some, there are complex geographic, demographic, and political factors at play that may make one country more susceptible to surge in cases than another. Some countries, such as Japan, which you can see at the bottom, took immediate action to slow the spread of the coronavirus by isolating COVID-19 cases and restricting travel. Others such as Italy saw their healthcare system quickly overwhelmed and the number of cases and deaths rose dramatically before they put effective measures in place. Next slide. So what are these effective measures countries put in place? Countries are responding worldwide by deploying various measures such as patient pathways, social isolation, communication channels, hospital and clinical capacity limits, staff deployment, contact tracing, and surveillance, just to name a few. 
Next slide. However, even with these aforementioned infection prevention and control measures, efforts were exacerbated by shortages of healthcare professionals, PPEs, and of vital supplies, not only for the acute care setting, but also for the alternate care settings. Next slide. My final comments. First, thank you to the healthcare leaders on the phone. Now, moving forward as we in Canada move past the first COVID-19 wave, healthcare leaders like yourselves are left contemplating what the path into and through phase two and three will look like for your families, for your patients, for your healthcare providers, and for the communities that you live and serve. Decisions around how and when to de-isolate have not been made lightly and are complicated by the fact that every jurisdiction seems to have a different reproduction rate. To help make sense of these extraordinary times, the rest of the presentation will provide opportunities for reflection to better care for a potential second or third COVID surge while maximizing resources. So let me now transition the presentation to my colleague, Jennifer Pinanzio, Beauty Canada's Strategic Marketing Director. Jennifer. Thanks, Don. So I'm gonna switch gears and highlight some of the capabilities that we have to support COVID-19 response, as well as share with you some of the lessons learned with health systems early on in this pandemic. Next slide, please. BD is deploying capabilities, expertise, and scale to address critical health needs related to coronavirus, including technologies that can be used to support research and development, diagnosing patients, uh, treating patients, surveillance, as well as devices to administer vaccines. Let's start with discovery. Solutions, instruments, and data analysis platforms are integral to helping researchers deepen our understanding of COVID at a cellular level, specifically in clarifying our pictures, picture of the body's immune system response. Cell analysis and sorting technologies can support more detailed knowledge of immune system responses to help researchers have a stronger foundation to develop more effective therapies, as well as accelerate the path to developing a much needed vaccine. Looking at diagnostics, and focusing on specimen collection. We've partnered with health systems to provide both swabs as well as UBT systems that are used to collect and transport clinical specimens for molecular viral testing and included not only for the diagnosis of flu but also coronavirus as well as tubes and lancets that are used to collect blood samples that will be used for serology testing. Diagnostic testing is a main focus in Canada and around the world right from the outset of this pandemic. As Jonathan mentioned, there are a number of different types of tests, and I'm going to talk through some of the technologies that we have to support. Molecular testing platforms were placed in many Canadian facilities prior to COVID-19 and are now being utilized for COVID-19 testing across Canada. At the outset of the pandemic, we supported expedited installation of our analyzers in COVID-19 hotspots. Additionally, as we look to the future in diagnostic testing, we're working to expand those testing capabilities with point of care immunoassays for COVID-19 that are in development, as well as a partnership for a rapid serology test that is pending regulatory approval in Canada. It's really important for us at this time to be thinking ahead around how these tests will be utilized and the potential need for these technologies in Canada in the future. On the front lines in the crisis, we're helping physicians and nurses manage medications, more safely deliver drugs and treatment to patients, as well as support advanced healthcare needs in the ICUs and other acute care settings. These products are widely used outside of the pandemic. However, as we'll discuss, we've really seen an increased demand across acute care uh, to support patients with these uh, technologies. We can also help health systems with pathogen surveillance that help to assess data on test results, drug inventory, hospital utilization trends, and more to help form a picture of risk and responses. And as we look ahead to cautiously returning to normal, our technologies can help detect early warning signs of reemergence of the disease. Finally, as researchers move into clinical trials for vaccines, we're supporting health systems with necessary delivery devices to help meet the needs of a potential vaccine once it's developed. So as you can see across this, this pathway, um, we're continuing to support both current and future health system needs as it relates to responding to this pandemic crisis. Next slide, please. 
So let's discuss in more detail some of our more recent lessons learned around supporting patient management, specifically in ICU and acute care setting, as well as tracking and reporting of COVID-19 data. Next slide, please. So early in the pandemic, we worked really closely with provincial shared service and procurement bodies to support ICU and acute care surge modeling of our critical technologies to help estimate the requirements for additional supplies to treat uh, patients that are, that are admitted to the ICU with COVID. This included working collaboratively with regional task forces to determine appropriate quantities needed based on current and anticipated hospitalizations, as well as understanding the potential treatment pathways. As access to healthcare facilities is limited uh, for our, our teams, we're really focusing now on adapting our clinical support of these critical products and procedures so that we can satisfy the demands of resource constrained hospitals through virtual training as well as implementation efforts. And additionally, we facilitated movement and modification of existing automated dispensing cabinets from less critical to more critical areas uh, where hospitals were having hotspot occurrences. Next slide, please. So some of our lessons learned through these engagements and collaborations with health systems is that we found that transparency between the health system and supplier was really critical to this process and should really include ongoing communication and touch points. As we engaged in these discussions across the country, it helped us to build an allocation strategy that included looking at current contracts as well as order history, uh, phased in product approaches where necessary, as well as hotspot allocations so that we could support current crisis activities in Canada. And by being proactive and coordinating efforts, suppliers can effectively ramp up production and can closely monitor inventory and customer ordering so that we can ensure supply continuity. Next slide, please. So robust surveillance and data tracking are another key area we wanna discuss. And you know, it's really critical to have this data and, and information in order to provide analytics of COVID-19 and other pathogens to inform healthcare leaders as well as systems on what they might need to do and how to plan for the future. With what we, we really urge health, healthcare leaders to consider automated surveillance software technologies, because with automated surveillance, it would be possible to aggregate pharmacy, laboratory, as well as patient data to provide the following analytics at the health system or population level. It would allow for heat mapping and trends of both flu and COVID-19 testing, where positive and negative results by hospital and patient's home postal code could be determined. It can provide demographics of COVID-19 positive patients, so looking at age and gender and, and other demographics. It could allow for changes in hospital utilization and percent capacities to be measured, so we could have information um, by ER, non-ICU units, and ICU units. It could support information um, sharing around changes in medication ordered, so understanding the top meds ordered, uh, again, by non-ICU or ICU units. And finally, it could support outcome reporting among, among COVID-19 patients, looking at things like readmission, length of stay, as well as the percent where we have escalated care. So in order to safely restart our economies, we really need both multifaceted testing capabilities as we've discussed, as well as advanced disease monitoring capabilities. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chelsea Smallwood, who will discuss the importance of coordination across local, provincial and federal agencies. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Smallwood and as mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of Health Economics and Public Policy for BD. And throughout the course of the pandemic so far, I've been responsible for liaising with the federal government as well as supporting discussions and planning within the provinces. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the need for coordinated efforts um, as we move into the next phases of the pandemic. Next slide. And so while I'll be focusing mostly on the intersection between the public sector and private sector, I did think that it would be important to really um, highlight the importance of mobilizing across all sectors to respond to the pandemic. In particular, really highlight the role of the nonprofit sector, um, particularly around non-government organizations and global relief agencies in supporting low and middle income countries and critical importance of civil society as well, particularly as they emphasize public health measures. Next slide. 
And so the focus of my talk will be primarily around how we've been working with governments and global health agencies, um, and in particular, the need for coordination. And I thought I'd focus around three key areas. Um, vaccination campaign planning, um, COVID-19 point of care tests, which my colleague John touched on uh, briefly, as well as serological testing. And then I'll touch briefly on grant making and engaging on the front lines as well. Next slide. And so in working with governments, we've really been focused around three key areas, uh, safeguarding operations, communicating capabilities, and mitigating capacity constraints. And safeguarding operations was really critical. Um, as the pandemic started, we saw lockdowns happening across the globe. And with manufacturing operations in many, many countries, it was really critical that we enabled our employees to continue to work um, within our manufacturing plants. Um, in Canada, we actually have a manufacturing plant based out of Quebec. And so it was essential that early on, uh, we partnered with the Quebec government to ensure that our employees working in that plant um, were able to continue to be seen as essential workers. Um, some of the products manufactured in that plant are actually COVID-19 test assays. And so that was really critical. Communicating capabilities was also essential. And you heard a little bit about those capabilities from my colleague, Jennifer. Um, early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of talk around shortages with personal protective equipment and ventilators. Um, and we really wanted to ensure that we were communicating early and were transparent about a number of other products that we felt would be essential for the treatment of patients um, with COVID-19 um, and that health systems were planning adequately and in advance of surge needs. And then finally, mitigating capacity constraints. As we think about all of the products that will be needed to continue to mitigate some of the risk with regard to COVID-19, um, a number of those products are not part of usual care. And so as you can imagine, um, we need to be planning much in advance for things like rolling out of vaccination campaigns um, in order to be prepared in advance and, and mitigate some of the capacity constraints with manufacturing. Next slide. So before I get into some of the more specific topics with regard to vaccination campaign planning, diagnostics and serological testing, I thought it would be interesting to share a bit more about the geopolitical landscape um, that was sort of pre-existing before uh, entering into this pandemic, um, but for which there's an intensification of some of those trends. The first being US-China relations. Um, we know that those were tense coming into the pandemic and the intensification there has really led to um, regionalization of manufacturing. Um, and it's also exacerbated this US trend toward disengaging with global, go global governance institutions, such as the WHO, for example. Um, and really what this has led to is um, where they have previously taken the lead was sort of bringing countries together toward a common good we're seeing countries now look more inward um, and sort of each one for their own. On top of that, before the pandemic, you know, there was sort of tense economic environment that was pre-existing um, and social tensions already brewing. Um, and that together with nationalism and populism um, has sort of, again, been intensified. And the way that this is manifesting throughout the pandemic is again, through more nationalism and seeing things like export restrictions um, and for example, in the United States, as you may or may not have heard about this Defense Production Act, whereby the United States can seize uh, medical products. And we saw an example of that with the 3M masks. Um, and so really, it's really critical that as we continue to move forward through the pandemic, um, in particular, that countries work together to ensure the flow of goods um, in an open global supply chain. And we know that Global Affairs Canada is working really hard on this. Next slide, please. And so sort of digging into that supply chain, um, it's been, I think, really enlightening throughout the pandemic um, to really see the complexity of the supply chain. And so I thought just to share with you sort of some key learnings um, and the impact of some of these components of the supply chain um, as it pertains to the, the advantage of really being coordinated. And so if you start with raw materials, we know that raw materials can be sourced from all over the world. Um, and acquisition of those raw materials really has an impact on manufacturing capacity. 
Um, we saw examples of this with uh, reagents, for example, for development of COVID-19 tests. And so access to those reagents and even the tubes that hold the reagents um, can really impact um, manufacturing capacity for those tests. As we move into the second phase, assuming that we can access um, the raw materials, um, is really around the, the sort of capacity of manufacturing that's existing today. And that really influences the global allocation of products. Um, and, you know, an example of how it's important to really be transparent around manufacturing capacity and plan together with health systems are things like, again, I'm going to pick on diagnostic testing, is looking at testing capacity. So you could imagine that while you may have, you know, a number of instruments within your health system that they may not be able to be run at full capacity, um, either because we have, you know, a shortage of test reagents or um, things like swabs. And so really thinking along the whole environment um, and along that supply chain is really critical to help for um, planning for public health, as well as communicating to the general public about what our goals are. And then the next phase, um, you know, once manufacturing is complete, you know, manufacturing happens all over the world and Canada is a great importer of uh, medical supplies. And so shipping is sort of the next um, hurdle to overcome. And as mentioned on the previous slide, you know, nationalism in the form of export restrictions can impact the flow of goods. And so all of this to say that it's really critical that we're coordinated. Um, next slide, please. And coordination can help with the accurate planning um, on the front end, but can also help, um, you know, protect Canada's goods um, and, you know, really help the federal government as they engage in international diplomacy. Um, and what we're looking to do with this type of coordination is, you know, avoid any kind of competition that might arise within the country. So while it may not be the intent, you know, provinces are, are looking to, to supply and prepare for their own populations, um, but an unintended consequence of that could be that some provinces are overprepared and some provinces are left behind. Um, and I always like to kind of relate back to the example of toilet paper. Um, never thought I'd be talking about toilet paper in a webinar. Um, but, you know, if you think about wanting to protect your own family at the beginning of this pandemic and, and stocking up on supplies of toilet paper, that left others, um, you know, without in a shortage. And so, you know, the more advanced we can be in our planning, the more proactive to understand needs, um, you know, the better we'll all fare in the end. Um, and so again, this, this coordination, both at the local, provincial, and in some cases necessary at the national level, um, can really help us both prepare for a result that's best for Canada as a whole, but also mitigate any future risk with regard to nationalistic actions by other countries. Next slide. And so I'll talk a little bit about how this um, coordination pertains specifically as we move um, sort of into the next phases of the pandemic. So talking about vaccination, um, again, point of care, COVID-19 testing, and serological testing for COVID-19 as well. So next slide. So vaccines have been um, the topic um, uh, as of late in the media. Um, and a lot of the questions have been around, you know, which countries are going to get the vaccine in what amount and when. Um, and that's really been the, the topic of the discussions to ensure that we have, you know, equitable, equitable marketing and distribution of the vaccine. Um, but as you might be aware these challenges are not limited to the vaccine itself. And so at the time that we have, you know, a successful vaccine candidate or maybe multiple successful vaccine candidates, there will be demand for really billions of injection devices, um, needles and syringes. And you know that that's an essential part of vaccine delivery. Um, every country will um, be demanding supply um, and you know you can imagine that as a manufacturer of these devices um, you know we have an intent to not disrupt the normal use of these and routine vaccination campaigns as well and so it's really critical that in order to mitigate um, any risk there that we work proactively um, and work together with the government and ideally coordinated across the whole country 
um, to secure those supplies. And that's what we've been doing in Canada over the last few months to ensure that no provinces get left behind um, and enable the best approach to mitigate um, any future risk as um, nations become competitive in acquisition of those products. Uh, next slide, please. So on the topic of sort of novel diagnostics that are being developed, um, point of care antigen tests. So those tests that uh, my colleague John was referring to um, that can be completed in, you know, around 10 minutes. Um, they're in devices that can be held in your hand. Um, we really need to think about how those fit within the testing algorithm, algorithm of a country um, and in Canada in particular. Um, you know, these types of tests could potentially alleviate the burden on labs, uh, but because of their unique um, attributes, we know that demand could potentially arise from really unconventional settings, such as, you know, the airline industry or retail pharmacies. Um, and again, since these are, you know, innovations that haven't been used yet um, for COVID-19 or in routine care, um, there will be you know, limitations on manufacturing. And so as early as we can be thinking about how these tests fit within our testing algorithm, the better prepared we'll be to deliver the tests um, in the right setting for Canadians. Next slide. And serological testing. So that is testing looking at whether or not um, you've been previously exposed to COVID-19. Um, you might be aware that there's a national immunity task force looking at the tests um, and determining the best course of action um, for deployment of those tests. Um, but depending on how the tests are used, um, they could require very large quantities of both, both the tests, but also the sample acquisition um, devices, so blood collection in this case, um, at the same time. And so again, as with some of these other technologies that we've been talking about, um, you know, it's really critical that we plan in advance. And unlike um, testing for COVID-19 as a diagnostic test, um, whereby we could sort of look to hotspots to see where the most, you know, fair allocation goes, um, you know, we don't really know what the uses of these tests will be in an optimal um, setting. And so demand planning can be more difficult in that case. And so this is just another situation in which, you know, transparency and coordination can really be beneficial. And next slide. Um, so that really completes the part of the talk focused on innovation and supply chain. Um, I did want to touch quite briefly just on our um, activities um, regarding investments and partnering globally. Um, you know, we've invested financially in a number of different organizations. You can see an example of those on the slide, as well as partnered with others such as FIND um, and ASLM. Um, to ensure that we can bring awareness to COVID-19 and provide training resources uh, in low and middle income countries. Next slide. Um, and finally, just wanted to highlight that, you know, the medtech industry as a whole has been working together um, with our healthcare system to overcome many of the obstacles that we've been presented with throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. You, the situation has been quite unprecedented. Um, and just wanted to take a moment to highlight you know, our service engineers that have been installing and servicing medical instruments, um, as well as the fact that we're really proud of our clinically trained associates who have been volunteering in hospitals to support frontline patient care. And I think really importantly, and across the sector, we've been adapting to enable virtual capabilities to support your clinical and service needs. Next slide. So showing this slide again and in closing, you know, we just want to communicate those last comments around, you know, where we've been successful in a smooth planning process has been where we've had early engagement, um, transparency and coordination. Um, you know, we really hope that this session was helpful. I'd really like to take a moment to thank all of you for your contributions throughout these incredibly challenging times and appreciate your attention throughout this session. Um, we welcome the continued collaboration and I believe opening it up now for questions. Thank you very much, Chelsea, Jennifer, and John. And I encourage the um, participants today to enter any questions you might have in the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, 
and we'll, I will moderate those questions. We also, I posted in the chat box something that the panelists has a, have asked you to, to um, share your thoughts on. So you can enter any thoughts you may have um, in the chat box and I'll bring those up as they come in. And just for those, so you can start percolating for the participants. Um, this is the question in the chat box. As you reflect on some of the key lessons learned that BD has shared today, how do CCHL members support breaking down barriers with industry partners for government? With, with industry partners and government. So sharing your thoughts online through the chat would be very welcome. I do have a question for the panelists. During this pandemic and as a global supplier, how are you sharing best practices around the world with Canadian health leaders? Thanks, Brenda. So I can, I can maybe start and then I'll ask Chelsea to, to add or, or John. Um, so, you know, Chelsea, John and I are both are all on uh, global meetings regularly with our counterparts across the world. And so, you know, as it relates to COVID-19, we, we are sharing our learnings um, through different uh, different forums. And our intention is to really bring bring them to webinars to Canada like this. Um, additionally, we have um, webinars that BD Global is running that is available to any um, Canadian uh, customer as well. So those are, are all different forms where we're hoping to share learnings across the globe. Thank you. Chelsea? Yeah, I might just add in too, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, there have been a number of other forums that have evolved. Um, and so, you know, BD and other uh, private sector companies are part of a med tech industry association. Um, and they've been really great for setting up a number of forums with both the federal government um, procurement side, but also with the Public Health Agency of Canada and the National Microbiology Lab. And this has been a really great forum to be able to both learn and, and share our insights as a company and globally. Hey, thank you. It sounds like you're very busy. Just looking at the slides and the work you've been doing. Wow, <laughs> it's impressive. Um, Second question, um, what is the ask of health leaders in supporting industry in order to prepare for potential next waves of this pandemic? I think I can take this one to start since I spoke about it a bit. Um, you know, I think a really helpful thing would be to invite um, industry partners to the conversation um, and as early as possible um, you know, these forums have started developing, but I think the earlier that we could be there and, and considered and invited, uh, that would make things a lot easier. Um, I also think that, you know, of the topics that we sort of went through today, planning for how the testing algorithm might change um, with the economy opening up um, and, you know, looking to increase the number of tests that we're able to perform, I think would be helpful if that thinking and planning could start now. Thank you. John, Jennifer, any, anything else said? No? I think we covered it well. Yeah, and we, we have seen, it's interesting, Chelsea, in your response, because we have seen partnerships and collaborations happening very quickly, um, very seamlessly with people that have never worked be together before. So I think including industry in that relationship have you, have you, and this is my own personal curiosity, have you, have you felt that kind of collaboration sort of bubbling up? Have you seen some of that or, is it, has, there, or has that been a gap that you've noticed? I can speak at least sort of from the federal government engagement level um, and what I've seen within the provinces, it has definitely improved considerably. I'd say the dialogue is certainly a two-way street um, and that's been really helpful. So I'd say keep it up. <laughs> um, you know, and just thinking of that question, I have one more thing to add, um, just in terms of thinking through the next phases of the pandemic. Um, I've seen some information come out now, but I think it'll be really helpful, um, especially from a public health perspective, to start educating the public around vaccinations um, and to start to tackle some of the skepticism around that. Um, just not really a BD thing, but I think this is a public health effort that we're all going to need to be engaged in. Um, that was my two cents. Okay. <laughs> I, I just have something to add to Brenda as it relates to your question there with, 
you know, we've seen definitely much more collaboration at the procurement, at the regional or health system procurement level. So working with regional pandemic task forces, procurement task forces to understand, you know, what products would be needed. As mentioned, we've, we've worked to support surge demand required to treat ICU patients as well as testing capabilities. And, you know, early on, we saw the, the value of that ongoing collaboration and having those regular touch points and open communication. It really helped us to inform our supply chain uh, needs um, and as well as manufacturing, but then also make sure that we can supply hotspots as needed. So very critical and much improved collaboration for sure. That's great to hear. Um, there is a question here from Julia. It's, would, would the panelists please comment on the potential to develop Canadian manufacturing of medical and diagnostic supplies and equipment? <laughs> I can take that one. Um, so in terms of diagnostic supplies, we actually do have manufacturing um, facility in Canada for that. Um, you know, I think part of the challenge, and this is something that we were um, considering and thinking about early on in the pandemic, is that for many medical supply are quite technical um, and detailed. And so setting up new manufacturing can be quite difficult, right? Unlike with, you know, some things like masks, perhaps where you can sort of set up 3D printing and, and that, um, you know, developing manufacturing lines for uh, diagnostic instruments can be quite difficult. Um, but I do think that it is something, um, you know, to consider as we move forward and in pandem pandemic preparedness for future possible pandemics as well as, you know, what manufacturing can be accomplished in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's, it's interesting because I was um, speaking with a senior leader from the Canadian Armed Forces and or doing a webinar and he mentioned the need for redundancy and we always think of redundancy as sort of a bad thing and you know you want to streamline processes and systems but this pandemic yeah. has really highlighted the almost the need for redundancy in some, in some ways. Yeah and I think it sort of goes back to that sort of new geopolitical order I think, you know, depending on how the elections go this year in the US, that will also kind of determine, you know, how necessary things like that are, um, you know, and how well countries can continue collaborating and keeping the flow of goods open, which I think, you know, there's quite a push for, for diplomacy, supply chain diplomacy, especially. And so mm -hmm. um, it'll be interesting to keep, keep abreast of that. Yeah. From... Albert, he, he's asking who decides what technology from BD is purchased by hospitals? Albert works at a hospital in the GTA. So we, uh, we work with the, the traditional um, procurement avenues. So your, uh, your shared service organizations, as an example, if we're in the GTA, um, would be accountable for procuring technology. So um, where existing contracts were, were evident or were available prior to COVID, um, those were, were leveraged. And then there were forums as well in each provinces whereby the, um, the provincial governments, you know, had a call out for specific technologies and uh, capabilities related to COVID that many vendors like BD as well as smaller companies would have uh, responded to. And so then there was kind of collaboration at the, the government level as well as at the, the hospital procurement level. It, I don't know if I specifically answered your question, but it definitely varied. There was there was actually more pathways for procurement during during this COVID than what we would see traditionally. Interesting. Chelsea, anything to add there? You covered it. Okay. <laughs> um, another question here from Elaine asking, what does the federal government need to do to improve supply chain nationally? Chelsea, take that one. Okay, I could try and take this one. Um, so I think depending on, you know, what part of the supply chain we're talking about, um, you know, I think as much as we can be coordinated with the provinces and territories, that's helpful from our end. Um, you know, I, I know that there was some discussion early on about, you know, looking for new um, ways to manufacture some of these critical products. Um, and I think where Canada has, you know, something to offer is actually geared toward the raw material capacity 
Um, and so I think that that would be interesting to take a look at, um, you know, where we could be supporting the raw material end of that supply chain um, so that we're not sort of double dipping into the same raw materials by trying to have, you know, more manufacturing of, you know, one um, type of uh, supplies. So if I can share the example, um, I think it was either masks or, or ventilators and I, I, sorry, I can't recall, but, you know, it was if you add another um, manufacturing capacity to Canada, we're still dipping into the same raw material um, sort of pool. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have strength in that sort of upfront piece as, as Canada. I don't know if that specifically answered the question, but. <laughs> That's hopefully. helpful. Lots yeah. to think about. And the question um, is, so reversing how, you know, how can we break down collectively some, some barriers between health leaders in Canada and, and industry partners and government. What are your thoughts? You want me to take that one? <laughs> yeah, Chelsea, you want to take that? I have some thoughts too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really helpful. During COVID, I think we've seen this come to light that when you have a common interest, right? How do we protect Canada during a mm -hmm. pandemic? I think it makes it easier for us to come to the table. Um, you know, I think the urgency has contributed to that as well. And so I think moving forward, you know, acknowledging that, um, you know, companies like ours exist because we have technologies that we think are helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, being able to articulate and, and come together in that middle ground, I think could be, you know, the way forward to, to sitting at the table, but also being open to, you know, we might not always have the perfect language um, to facilitate that conversation, but how do we start to get there? And so sort of opening the door to it, I think is a good first step. Um, yeah, I like that. Any thoughts from my colleagues? I think being engaged early on in terms of planning and even supporting, you know, as I'll give an example with um, surge planning for the ICUs. So thinking about all the supplies that are outside of ventilators and PPE we would need to support those additional patients in the ICUs. Um, we looked at how can we support through modeling? How can we help hospitals understand what their anticipated requirements would be for specific items, like even down to catheters and things that are consumables that are going to be used by these um, health systems. And, you know, it was a great opportunity to have that dialogue if we were brought to the table early. And in some cases, you know, there were systems that were looking to procure a lot of product that they maybe didn't even need. We were actually able to provide modeling to show, you know, here's what we anticipate you might need. Um, and they were able to, to kind of procure with, with some of that knowledge and, and analysis. So, you know, the earlier on we can, we can be, you know, brought to the table to support, and, you know, I think we can, we can really help to improve outcomes as it relates mm -hmm. to some of these challenges we're existing. I can add one more uh, perspective medically. Because medical affairs in BD is in every country where we are, um, we can reach out to our global medical affairs counterparts and look at, and that's where a lot of my information is coming from, from Italy or from China or from the United States uh, and every jurisdiction is to understand why the difference in rates. So, you know, I compliment the question about how can we get involved? You know, we are with you every step of the way. We are you know, with you at night, we're in every part of your hospital, um, just call us. You know, we have a common ground, which is the patient safety and look forward to helping. That's great, thank you. Um, there's a question, another, well, don't, don't mute your mic yet, John. There's another question for you. Um, what's your best scenario for a successful vaccine? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, there's, what's the best scenario? Let's put it this way. Um, if I take the framework of timelines, we'd like to have a vaccine within the next six to 12 months. Number two, we'd like to have a vaccine for everyone um, that can be distributed to marginalized and also uh, every community in Canada, irrespective of where they are geographically and everyone in the world. Um, I think that is access to care. And number three, I go with Chelsea's comment, which is uh, we need to really help educate and diminish the concerns related to vaccination. Because if we put this in perspective, you know, I, I've already mentioned about the contagion and its impact and also the risk factors. We currently right now don't have a virus or a medication to manage COVID-19. So that would be the best scenario, which is the ability to produce 
a vaccination, distribute it globally, and obviously have everyone accept the vaccine. Now, there may be some underlying concerns. We understand that with every uh, group of individual, but again, that acceptability and access to care, irrespective of the geographic location of an individual worldwide would be the best scenario. Mm -hmm. And you know, I see a pattern in, in, in the thinking in this webinar, as well as in others, is, is the building of relations, communications about vaccines, about partnerships, with, before the crisis happens. So establishing, um, you know, the industry and healthcare partnerships and, and collegiality before it happens so that it already, the relationships exist before you act, absolutely need the, or in the crisis. And there's a lot of learning going on. Sorry, Jennifer? No, that's very, I just agreeing with you, I think really critical. And I think, you know, we anticipate potential surges or, you know, next waves. So having that foundation now, I think will just make us so much more effective should there be another, another wave. Um, I want to just, I want to say thank you to uh, John, Jennifer and Chelsea for today's webinar and for the work that you're doing to support the Canadian health system. I could see through that there's a caring element through, through what you've shared and what you've presented that is very valuable. So thank you for that. Um, to the participants today, thank you for your time and commitment to lifelong learning, in particular during these worrying and flustering times. And my hope is that participating in webinars such as, as this, um, we can, the college can support you as you navigate the expectations placed on you as a health leader in our, health, in our Canadian system, and hopefully contribute in some way to, to you maintaining the balance that you need in your lives. Um, because we're all running on, on high octane right now. So thank you and take care.